Um, next up, I think we're just going to show a slide of our upcoming chapter events. We've been hosting weekly events. So there's the list of what's coming up. Another COVID track next week. And just keep checking the, the website. And that is noted at the bottom of the page. And we'll, you'll get your updates there. And with that being said, I'm going to turn this over to Joy Jordan, Executive Vice President with Sterling Bay, who's going to lead the conversation today. Thanks, Lauren, and thanks for having me. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Joy Jordan, EVP here at Sterling Bay. Uh, thanks again for letting me moderate this panel uh, with such a great group of folks. Uh, before we start, you know, I will say that this has probably been the most talked about topic uh, here internally at Sterling Bay. I think there's quite a bit of opinion going around and opinions that perhaps have changed uh, a little bit since we started this whole at home COVID uh, experience or fog, however way you, you kind of frame it. Um, so I'll be really curious to kind of hear from each panelist. Um, every single one that we have here today has a lot of different experiences in various fields. So I think, you know, in terms of their feedback, I'm curious to kind of get their opinion. Uh, but before we start, uh, would love to kind of do a quick intro around the room uh, by everyone introducing themselves. So I'll start with uh, Wendy Katz, if you want to lead us off. Sure. Hi, I'm Wendy Katz. I'm Executive Director with Cushman & Wakefield Agency Leasing Team and um, represent office buildings downtown and looking forward to sharing everything. So we've got Michael Klein, if you want to go ahead. Sure. Uh, thanks a bunch, Joy. Michael Klein, uh, I'm the Managing Principal at Glenstar Properties. We have about 9 million feet of office properties between uh, Chicago and Dallas, and we're split pretty evenly between uh, both CBD and the suburbs. So we've had a lot of experience, especially with Texas now having been open about five weeks uh, with uh, reoccupying. So uh, thanks for having me. Lisa? Sure. Hi, I'm Lisa Konechka, an executive vice president at CBRE. Uh, so I've been with the firm through various acquisitions, um, going back to my days actually starting in the industry at Rublev uh, for 32 years. So only job I've ever had and uh, look forward to spending some time talking about things with all of you and our panelists today. Ellen. Hi, uh, Ellen May with uh, Tishman Spire. I uh, work on the leasing team here. We have about 7 million square feet today in the Chicago market. Um, and we're, we're kicking up one of our first developments um, in many years. So uh, excited to discuss all of the impacts and things that we're seeing. Then you get Steve. Uh, first, it's great to be with such a, a great group. Um, I probably have the most tenure here. I'm pretty sure that, uh, as it turns out, I, I chair JLL's headquarters practice group. Um, and I think the interesting angle is having done this for over 40 years, I, this is somewhere between the eighth and the ninth economic correction or recession. So a lot of scars uh, and usually end up on my feet. So we'll see what happens in this one. So I look forward to the panel. Thank you. Okay, great. So, um, you know, I'll ask a number of different questions. I think to start off, I would love to kind of start from more of a macro standpoint in terms of what we're seeing um, overall with this whole COVID issue. So I personally started in the business back in 2008 um, when our economy was going through a recession. So, you know, what I'd love to hear is with COVID and the way it really kind of hit us from the unemployment standpoint and the speed at which it hit us, how does this really compare to what we saw and what we went through back in 2008? Um, and maybe Wendy, you can start us off since you started with uh, the intro. Sure. I, you know, a lot of people ask us this question and I, I don't know how to really compare it with past recessions because this is a global pandemic. You know, to say it's, you know, comparable to the most recent recession about 10 years ago or the dot com, it's really hard to compare the two. Everyone's affected. Every single person in this world, personally, professionally, people, you know, don't have jobs. They have people in their families that are, that are sick or they're worried about being sick. I think the biggest question is, there's so many unknowns. It's not like we're saying, oh, this will be done by December 31st. 
there are too many unknowns about the pandemic and it just has an effect upon everything. So I, I think it's, it's reaching uncharted territory. And um, like you said at the beginning, it was such a shock to everyone. You know, you're in the office one day and then everyone's home. And trying to all of a sudden establish work from home habits and how do you handle working from home with your families and caring for people and, you know, hopefully, you know, have a job and, and connecting with your teammates. And it's, it's just, it's something that I, I personally think that we really can't compare. Yeah. Michael, from an owner's perspective, do you have any input in this? Yeah, you know, uh, I, I totally agree with Wendy. Um, the way it, it, if you look at this pandemic and you look at this recession that we're clearly in and you compare it to others, um, also really hard. And, and an analogy I heard, which I thought was really on topic was, if you look back at 2008 as an example, and you look at what happened and you go to your local hair salon, nail salon, a place like that, and you talk to people back in 2008, they would say, you know, our business is off 20 or 25 percent and it hurt them and there was an impact and over time they built that business back up if you talk to those same people today they went to zero right so overnight they went from 100 miles an hour to zero so when you think of it that way and and pretty much across the board for many different industries in this country it's it's really unprecedented so from a a you know how do things look going forward? I think anybody uh, who, who thinks they know, uh, it's, it's a guess. And I think that we can look at history and know at some point we will be back. We've always come back. Uh, when it comes to timing and how do you parallel these things, it's just so different than like, like Steve, I've lived through too many of these. I can't even count anymore. And uh, I think that living through these, uh, everyone's been a little different. This one feels significantly different because of the whole, not only global effect, but the whole medical side, the health issue that just has never been there before. Sure. I think if there's a silver lining, it's that the financial institutions today are, are in a much stronger position in part because of the you know, great recession of 2008, 2009. And that is when part where the weakness was, right? It was the banks and, and all the institutions, Bear Stearns and Lehman that went down in, in 2008. And I think the thing that's still bolstering the stock market is that there was a financial certainty to the strength of our you know, economic base, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't mean that the retail, hospitality and service industries, including airlines, et cetera, haven't been hit horribly. And it's that the unemployment hit in 90 days where in 2008, it took two and a half years to feel the real impact of the unemployment because it was, such a slow moving, very disastrous, but very slow moving uh, impact on employment. This has just been so sudden. Um, and I think the, the, the other part of it is that everybody's speaking to such a significant paradigm in the work world, where times ago, it, it last recession, it wasn't around the space. And I think that impacts our industry perhaps more than other than the other recessions. So we'll talk about that, but I think, uh, I think those are the big issues, or the takeaways I have right now. Yeah, makes sense. So along with, you know, the same line as what we kind of experienced in 08, you know, one thing that we're seeing is subly space hitting the market. Depending on which report you read, um, you know, we're up to about a million three, a million five, which is a lot of additional subly space in just over two months. And, you know, one of the questions I have is, there's been a lot of talks, right, in terms of how tenants are going to be utilizing space moving forward. And subway space that's in the market has already been pre-built, right, to standards of previous tenants. How do you think this space is going to lease up in this environment? And do you think it will lease up as quickly as it did back in 08? Alan, you want to oh, take that one or Lisa? Go ahead, go ahead Lisa. Well, I think... Um... I do think that there is going to be a lot of interest in sublease space. And I think that the drivers, they, they think there are two parts to the process. One is, is, is do people, occupiers really believe that they need to fundamentally change their space on a long-term basis, right? And I think that's what everyone is grappling with. And I don't know that 
there have been many occupiers thus far who have said, yes, let's fundamentally change how we use the space. We're never going to go back because it's just a lot of unpredictable things still to happen, right? This is changing every day, every minute. Um, so I think that what we look at is, is really what are the things that you do know? And I think what most occupiers know is, is that cap if you want to make moves, capital is going to be constrained until we see a recovery on an economic basis. And so that is where sublease space or spec suite become, I think, a little bit more attractive is that companies, especially since you don't know exactly what you need and you're not so convicted mm -hmm. in that bag that's in the ground to say, I must have my space laid out exactly this way. They may choose to look at the benefits of a sublease space where there's a minimal capital investment and maybe making some compromises in the way that the space is laid out, make that move for the short term or for the, even the medium term and then wait and see how everything shakes out. Um, so I think I do think that sublease space is definitely going to be a, a pretty big factor in the market. And as if Joy, if, you know, the, the numbers I know, I hear anything from 1.5 million to an anticipated <laughs> 5 million square feet are coming on the market. Right. That's, like, that's like taking over over a six month period and dumping, you know, three new high rise office buildings on the city of Chicago, notwithstanding all of the new development that's also in play. Um, so it is definitely going to be something that we have to consider. And I think it'll be interesting to see how landlords react and I'd love to hear maybe Ellen can start this on how landlords will react knowing that sublease space often is in a distressed circumstance right and you, you, people need to get rid of it I guess the only last thing I will say is is that it's a cautionary tale and I'll go back unfortunately again my tenure takes me here as does a couple of the other panelists is to go back to the dot-com crash that happened right and that was a circumstance where there were tons of subleases available but that was a very slippery slope to take on those uh, being a sub lessor or sub lessee in those spaces because you didn't have a lot of creditworthiness or substance substance behind your your sub landlord which was which was scary so a lot of issues i think that we learned a lot from but certainly i'd love to hear from ellen as to how the landlords perceive this potential sublease space coming onto the market yeah, I mean, we see it as a, you know, it's certainly going to be a factor in the market and certainly a drag on um, direct absorption, uh, it, particularly because we, we know that the space that will come on this time, as opposed to 2008, will be really space that's new, it's invested in. Um, granted, it's probably more in this more modern workplace strategy of open high density spaces, which I think, as you know, Joyce, to your point, right, it, that will be a component of it that may Flow it, or maybe there has to be a discount because people can't use it for the density that it was designed. Um, but so we, we know we see it. We know it's going to happen, right? It, it will be a factor. It will be a competitive factor. Um, I think it impacts how we think about spec suites, right? Because we think that there, we think that there will be a need, as you said, Lisa, for no capex transactions. A lot of anybody that is willing to move is probably not going to want to take on any capital constraints. So you'll be competing with that, but I think on a, um, you know, brand new spec suite, you're spending as much on that. So how do, how do we moderate that? And so as an organization, we're moving forward with some spaces, but we did pull back in some instances um, where we think that that will be too much of a competitive with some of these newer particular technology like spaces. Um, but I think it is, you know, the landlords having built ready space that can make everything, you know, Flexibility being you know, probably one of the biggest categories that, that I think as an owner we can offer. Um, being able to do that within those spaces because um, uh, subleases will have defined term, which I think we'll, we, you know, owners can have a little bit more flexibility around that too, which we think is going to be critical. Ellen, do you think it will affect uh, direct rental rates? I'm sorry. For landlords? Well, well, I mean, I, yes, I mean, probably. I mean, it, it will also be interesting to see how the subleases trade, right? Who, who's going to set the market for those deals? Because a lot of what the subleases that are going out, they're not defining pricing, right? Because nobody knows what the pricing is. So until you start to see transactions and comps, um, it's hard to know, right? And so I think it'll be a drag just on, um, on you know, on uh, direct absorption, but on an it ultimately will hurt you probably on an effective basis and maybe you know ultimately in rents yeah well, don't you think yeah. that you know some of the i you know as someone who's put some subleases on the market as of late 
um, there is a hesitancy to want to set specific pricing out of the box because we haven't seen demand and right so we've got we've already got the supply side of the equation and we're waiting to see what's going to happen on this demand side of the equation um, because if it come if it comes to a place where most folks say let's just stay in place even if it's a two or three year kick the can in our current environment and we have minimal demand then obviously when you chase demand rates come down yeah i think the other the other thing on the supply side is that you know there's so much p l sensitivity in the corporate world right now and in those subleases that have been put on the market are are many that are still kind of feeling their oats on the public uh finance side but every corporation that puts sublease space on the market has got to take a write-off and right now they're super sensitive to any p l impact that's negative so i think the spread between a million or so to five million feet is probably where corporates are waiting to kind of see if they have to go to the sublease or disposition market versus uh, other run rate implications of this whole kind of recession so i think there's probably another million or two million feet just on the sidelines lisa from the corporates ready to put sublease on the market space on the market but they don't get the go ahead from their cfo because of the financial impact so yeah. A lot of, there's a lot right. of anticipation and uncertainty still that's, uh, you know, yet to wean, wean itself through the market. Yep. Agreed. Which makes sense. Um, so I have a little bit of more of a general question for Chicago. You know, this pandemic has really brought out a lot of different debates uh, among the Republicans and Democrats and different states. Don't worry, Steve, we're not going to get into a debate uh, mm -hmm. on, on politics right, right now. So but, um, you know, as a state, right, Illinois, you know, the past few years, we've had a bit focus in terms of going out and attracting companies, right, from other states, a lot of different factors in terms of why Illinois has been attractive. Um, you know, obviously, our, our protests and the economy and different things going on with Chicago has not been all that positive the past few weeks, few months, I should say. How do you think, you know, moving forward, all of this is going to affect um, this trend, right, of out-of-town companies looking at Chicago? And are you bullish on it moving forward and kind of staying positive? Um, and, Steve, I know that you actually, you know, deal with a lot of HQs and, and talk to a lot of folks from out of state. So I'd be curious to kind of hear your thoughts on this one. You know, I'm, I'm a proud Chicagoan, and uh, the impact of last Saturday or Saturday ago was, uh, was really uh, – you know, impactful to me personally. Um, I still see a resilience. I think Whitefoot has done a, a pretty good job of kind of combating some of the underpinnings of it. I, there's a couple pieces I think that are really important in kind of backfilling this uh, kind of potential reduction in workforce and change. And I think there's gonna be some reshoring. So there's a combination of things that are, you know, headcount growth because of the great talent base in the Midwest and Chicago's as its anchor I think there's some reshoring to be done versus a lot of the onshoring that had gone on from a lot of the corporates in the Midwest and Chicago. I think the other part of that is it's, uh, it's going to be the corporate's obligation to find a way to get more job opportunities to the diversity side of our, of our community. And that I think is going to be a positive impact if, our, if we can actually get our act together to, to figure that out. That I think will be important catalyst to the fundamental good things that Chicago had going for it, which is central location, fairly low cost of, of doing business and living and a great educational base and a great kind of urban environment. So I, I think it's going to take a while to wean itself out, but I, I do believe that if we get our shift in gear for some of the social pressures and get our basics back to, to ground zero, I think Chicago is going to be fine. Uh, absent some of the shifts in social, you know, adjustment, I think, you know, all major metro areas, particularly in the north and the urban areas, are going to have a big problem. And who would have thought Minneapolis was going to be the hotbed of this? I mean, I do a lot of business up there. It's a great city. Had no clue that there was that political police, you know, unrest in that market. You just don't get it. So um, I think there's a lot to be done. I, I, I would say that we have to fight hard against the southern cities, which I think are going to have an edge coming out of this. And, uh, but I think we're strong enough to do that. All right. Michael, do you have uh, any input on that in terms you of know, Chicago? It's, and it's Joy, thanks for asking. Um, it's, it's interesting because uh, really how we're set up, right? We have a Dallas office in Chicago and 
for the last six years, we've watched Dallas, uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth area, add about 145,000 new residents every year. Every year. So you just kind of put that in perspective and you say over the last six years, it's like three quarters of a million people have moved into the DFW area where we've seen a slow, you know, decline. Now, having said that, we're bullish on Chicago. Um, it, if you look at the Midwest and you talk to kids coming out of universities and anywhere within, I think it's a six or eight hour sort of drive of Chicago, they want to be in Chicago. So from an educational perspective, there's really nothing in the Midwest that beats Chicago. Um, Texas is still one of the, you know, Sunbelt states. And so we don't see that changing. And, and again, we've seen, you know, continued growth there. And even during this pandemic, um, and even during all the social unrest, as we just look in general about attitude and activity, it feels a little better down there. Now, it may be because they opened up a little earlier. They've run into some issues since it looks like. But just overall, uh, the, the demographics and what's happened down there have been really positive. But I, I still am a believer that Chicago, because of where it's located, because of the, the education, because of the health care, um, is going to continue to be a driver. And, you know, as you look at workforces and we look at our tenants, um, that's what they're looking for is a very educated workforce. And, um, you know, most, again, most universities, most kids that graduate, if they're in the Midwest, they want to come back to Chicago. Yeah. I'll just want to add on one, yeah. one little idea on this is um, if, you, if you think about, I agree with everything that both Steve and Michael have said, and, and I do think that our our workforce is something that is very powerful. And I think that there's an interesting thing that could happen here is that um, we're looking at remote work being a much more vital part of our, of our world, right? And so there are opportunities for companies to actually take advantage of the workforce in Chicago without necessarily having to first open an office because of this remote work. But we know what happens is, is once you get some level of critical mass of employees that are in a centric area, the company opens an office in that area. So I actually think that there is a unique opportunity here for Chicago as we're going through, you know, as Steve said, we've got some work to do. Um, certainly all of these cities have work to do, but the fact that we have this vital workforce could bode well for sort of strengthening our recovery a little bit down the way. So just knowing that you can hire somebody from just about anywhere right now, right? Because you don't need them to come to an office. So, um, and if, if our talent is as great as, as we think it is, which I think it is, then I think it should go well for us. Yeah, makes sense, makes sense. Um, so now moving along with a little bit more building specific questions, um, with everything happening, there's been a lot of different tenants heavily, heavily impacted um, with the economy. So from the folks that are more on the landlord side, you know, what are you doing right now outside of maybe rent relief to really help some of these companies that are within your buildings? Um, you know, maybe one day you want to take this one, just out of curiosity. I imagine, you know, with the number of tenants that you're dealing with, you must have had a, quite a bit of ask from different tenants in terms of abatement, rent relief, et cetera. So just kind of curious, you know, what you guys are doing moving forward. Yeah, as you can imagine, um, so many tenants came to our clients and immediately were asking for rent abatement or rent deferral. Um, and we really, our owners, was particularly if they had a lot of retail tenants, they were being bombarded. Um, and they really had to evaluate each one and they actually would have to request that each tenant provide information on what was going on and what hardships they were having. Um, many of our owners, depending upon the tenant, uh, did provide maybe mostly maybe a rent deferral situation. And maybe they were saying, okay, if your lease is expiring in a couple years, let's do a short term extension. And we can, instead of pro providing you free rent then, we can move it up now and do something like that. So um, those are certain ways that our owners have been trying to work with tenants. And they also have to watch and see what is happening right now. You know, some of them have had to lay off their employees and maybe they're okay for now, but what's gonna happen, you know, six months from now or 12 months from now, because their hardships could continue. So they're really taking it day by day while trying to figure out, okay, how can I manage marketing my building in general? So it really depends upon the owner, the asset, and also the tenant, because it really depends, each, each building is so different the way it's structured. 
Hey, Wendy, does the lender have to approve any concession? Uh, it really depends, Steve, upon maybe the size of the tenant, the amount of uh, rent deferral or rent abatement they're talking about, and the structure of it. Most of the time, no. I, I mean, I think we've only had to deal with it maybe a couple times. Yeah, great, thanks. Yep. Alan, would you agree with a lot of, from Wendy? Yeah, I mean, I think we've been, we feel uh, pretty lucky in Chicago. Uh, you know, most of our buildings are well occupied and we have uh, great um, tenants. So on the office side, we, we've had some asks for sure, um, but we have really haven't have been in a position with, with few select incidents or, uh, where we've, we've provided um, some deferral uh, in, in, you know, a not-for-profit situation. Um, and then on the retail side and the retail side, you know, it's such a small percentage of our buildings, maybe 1%, but it's so critical to the success of the asset and to encouraging yeah. people to come back to be able to have that. So we are partnering with them in a, in a variety of different ways and trying to promote them as the, as the buildings kind of reopen, but having to share with them that we think, you know, the density in the population is going to be much slower to return than I think anybody had originally hoped. So we, we see that support for those groups um, being extended for, for a while. But again, we're, we're very committed to, to their success. Yeah, that makes sense, makes sense. Um, and so along those lines, you know, when we talk about building amenity spaces in Chicago, um, you know, a lot of different landlords have spent quite a bit of money in redevelopments, right, and spending quite a bit of dollars with incredible amenities for tenants. With everything going on, we obviously can't fully reopen amenities. So, you know, part of my question is, do you think moving forward, you'll still see this trend? Or do you think Chicago will kind of take a little bit of a pause, right, in terms of utilizing such large amenity spaces in various buildings? Um, Steve, Lisa, maybe you want to take this one? Go ahead, Lisa. Okay, um, you know, I, I think that this is all a pre post vaccine conversation and I don't think we know exactly, you know, obviously we, we, I think we all have, comp, have either hope or confidence that we'll see a vaccine, you know, sometime in the end of this year, beginning of next year and hopefully ready, readily available within 12 months. And so I would liken the amenities conversation probably to um, to just what we see in our hospitality world, because that's really what amenities are, is their hospitality. And, and you know, so I think you have to think, do you believe that, you know, besides the restaurants that aren't going to be in business anymore, are people going to stop going out and sort of engaging with other folks in public? I, I don't think they are. And I think that a lot of companies um, are going to need to be pretty careful about their their space. So I do think that those additional amenities being offered by landlords are still going to be valuable. Is it going to be used over the next 12 months? Not a lot. So maybe landlords might want to be cautious about if they're embarking on a new plan about how they develop that because there may be things that are informed to sort of shift, but I don't think that they go away. Yeah, I would tend to agree with that uh, almost across the board. I think you know, if you look over the last five or 10 years and the, and the huge shifts of workplace and amenities and, and building culture within the space and using the amenities of the building to you know, provide that happy spot for the employees to collaborate, work out, whatever it might be, have a cocktail, cup of coffee. I can't see that reverting back to zero. I think it's gonna take a while through the health you know, correction, if you will. Um, and I think the bigger issue is, will there be, you know, a reduction of 20 to 30 percent in the demand side, which will impact utilization and how will that offset uh, how landlords think about that investment? Um, and that's kind of, a, we can have a conversation later about that. But, but I think in the next 12 months, we all hope that we'll be back to a much more level of normal in using our office space, you know, if we get that vaccine in place. Um, and along with that, I think people will not abandon the need to have those casual collisions outside the office and places to, you know, do your thing. So uh, th th right. I agree with you. So, yeah. You know what, and Steve, if you think about it, if, if the idea that potentially 20 to 30 percent, if companies start to think that 20 to 30 percent of their workforce could work from work remotely on a more regular basis than maybe was planned before, 
there are going to be times when those folks all come to the office and there isn't going to be enough space. And so the amenity space will become all the more important as a place to sort of help with some of that overflow in the event that that, that were to happen. So yeah, I think I mean, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've kind of tabulated that 20 to 40 percent reduction through uh, maybe a 10 percent utilization uh reduction because right now it's you know corporate for those corporates on the on the on the line would probably agree that 60 or 70 percent utilization at the high water mark for most of their portfolio so if you ring out 10 or 15 percent of efficiency and you take an increased mobility across those who had not been mobile uh then you look at that 30 percent as a pretty easy target i mean jll as an example has about 25 percent of their workforce in their hq at aon mobile already and most of us are probably mobile 10 or 20 percent or 30 percent of the time already so but it's those corporates that have a one-to-one -one seat to, to person ratio they're going to correct out of that utilization rate and this and then this more untethered you know mobility strategy um and i think our job then with landlords is to figure out how do they get to that 20 to 40 percent stretch mark over this period of time in the next two to three years to test it out because they're, they're, they're trying to get cost reduced through this new adjustment of, of, of square footage. Uh, and they're still testing the realities of mobility and work from home or work from where it's almost work from anywhere. Right. Um, and if short term, that's probably the biggest amenity is giving you the flex to work from anywhere. So. Right. Makes sense. Um, so along, you know, along the same lines, and, and by the way, when you talk about, um, you know, people eventually coming back to somewhat normal, you know, I will say downtown with the patios being open, you know, you talk about people going back to normal. It's crazy how packed the patios are in the city now that they've been open. I mean, it's like, you know, two and a half months ago, we had COVID that hit. Everyone wouldn't go outside. There's been no vaccine. There's no medication for it. And, you know, all of a sudden people just are much more relaxed about being close to each other, maybe not wearing masks um, and not having the six feet, you know, distance that you're supposedly, you know, have to have to have right now. Um, so it'll be, it'll be interesting to see, you know, from a building perspective, a money perspective, you know, how quickly that goes back at some point. Um, so, you know, when we talk about co-working space, um, I know there's a few of you guys that have co-working internally within, um, you know, your company. There's been, you know, anytime you have a, you know, a, a down strike in, in the economy, you know, one of the first tenants that gets hit is co-working. Um, what do you see as the future for a lot of these bigger co-working spaces, um, you know, like a WeWork or Convene or some of these other ones? Um, you know, in 08, co-working wasn't really, you know, hot and, and growing. And as the economy got much better, you obviously saw a lot of growth downtown Chicago with certain, you know, companies. Um, so, Michael, maybe you want to take this one? Yeah, we, we actually, <laughs> an interesting one for us, we don't have our own co-working. Uh, we don't have yeah. a lot of co-working in our buildings. In fact, out of our 9 million square feet, uh, we don't have a WeWork in our building. We were early on pushing and saying, look, we've got some traditional Regis uh, space or more traditional Regis space. Um, Steve and I have had this discussion a little bit. Some of the things that, that we've looked at, at least in the short term, again, pre-vaccine, post-vaccine, pre-vaccine, um, we've marketed, just started marketing as Chicago's opening up, that we'll do short term, meaning like six months, uh, spec suites in the burbs. We have spec suites in almost all of our properties and they're, they happen to be built out in a way where you can socially distance, unlike downtown and our properties downtown that are much more dense. Our properties in the suburbs never got that dense. Um, we signed our first lease last week up in Bannockburn, not big, 3,500 square feet, but it was a tenant downtown who had a group of people who live up north and they wanted to be together. The other thing that we're doing, and this goes back into amenities a little bit, we had built at one of our projects uh, on Rolling Meadows, Continental Towers, and up at Bannockburn Lakes, which sits on like 45 acres. We did some really great outdoor space where people can get together outdoors, be apart, and have meetings. And we actually on Monday had our first company together meeting. Where did we do it? We did it in Rolling Meadows. We did it at Continental Towers. 
We have over an acre park that we built. We spread out all of our chairs and furniture. We had these, you know, uh, Adirondack chairs in a way that we were truly socially distanced. And we've done that with all of our, our uh, properties in the suburbs. So, you know, as we, as we look at co-working, I think at least sort of pre-vaccine, there'll be less. Now, do I think that's gonna be a trend that's gonna last forever? No, and as Lisa said, I do think there's a post-vaccine world. I think co-working will come back like it's come back in the past. But I think pre-vaccine, I think there's gonna be a lot more demand for companies who wanna, you know, sort of be self-isolated knowing this is so, so most companies, at least most of our tenants, have created their own protocol. And again, our Texas uh, properties are a little ahead of Chicago as far as occupation. And as we look at those, those that have come back, they have their own protocol in place. And the idea of mixing in a co-working environment with companies that may have different protocols probably doesn't feel as good as having your own space. So it's still really, really early. And I don't think there's yeah. a lot of people rushing back to the office yet. So I think it's too early, but yeah. that's sort of what we're yeah. seeing right now. I was gonna say um, right now, a lot of the co-working firms are probably having issues getting membership fees because right now they're mm -hmm. not getting the people in their space. But right. I, I agree with Michael. I think over time, very soon, it could be a great solution for temporary space, for flexibility. Sure for a lot of these enterprise groups that need a space for their people um, while they figure out what is their headcount or if they have certain projects working on. And again, I think we're all seeing that, you know, workplace, it's not a specific office, it's gonna be an mm -hmm. ecosystem. So you could have your downtown office, you could have a co-working area for a short-term project, then you could have a suburban satellite office that, you know, maybe a couple years or maybe that's co-working. So it's going to be what people are going to be working in different spaces to whatever may work and work from home is going to be part of our lives. It, it just, it's going to be part of what everyone's going to be doing. So co-working it, you know, a month or two ago, I would have said, Ugh, forget it. They're never going to survive. But now I think it, it's something that they can adjust to and may help a lot of companies. Yeah. Yeah. That's going to be fun. Yeah, I think that flexibility is really the driver for all of that, right? And what people want. And I think as the large corporates look at their portfolios and, and absorb what work from home has done to their, their use of utilization, we think that co-working and, and those kind of partnerships can be, um, can add a level and a depth of flexibility to their, to their platform um, across the markets. But in the near term, yeah, it's going to be a little, it's going to be. Yeah, I, I yeah. think. Two, two perspectives. One is that um, we've had some panel discussions with clients and those under enterprise agreements really believe that there's value in those co-working relationships. Call it more yeah. flex than co-working. It's really flex relationships. Um, I think the, the question going forward is the financial viability of those firms and therefore landlords potentially like Tishman or Heinz uh, Brookfield um, and others, Blackstone, who might then build their own kind of interstitial flex floors uh, for an acre ten, it might be a better way to drive that flexibility without impinging on the value and encumbrance of big tall buildings, right? So I think that again, it's incumbent on, you know, Lisa, myself and other tenant sensitive folks to start building those flexibility points using those interstitial flex floors, either institutionally through the landlord or through our co-working partners. Um, and if they're still around and viable, I think they're, they're legit. I think the other part would be somewhere if it's a co-working company that has financial question marks, can the landlord agree to step in and solve that if we're going to be the anchor tenant in that building? And I think there's that linkage at some point that might have to come in the next 12 to 24 months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Um, so now I want to talk a little bit about trends, right, and kind of what you're seeing. Um, there's been a lot of talk about, quote unquote, healthy buildings, right? Buildings that are spending a little bit more money in terms of making the building feel safer, right, for employees to come back. And that could be new developments, it could be redevelopments or older assets that you have in the loop. Do you think, you know, moving forward, you'll see a little bit more of a trend you know, especially with larger companies 
um, that will want to focus in buildings that are quote unquote spending a little bit more time and money on these initiatives to make it feel safer for employees moving forward rather than going into perhaps a redevelopment that you know really can't compete on certain aspects for that i mean i, I think that one? i, I think oh, yeah, I would say, I think, I think that's definitely going to be a trend, for, particularly for corporations, right? I mean, I think it won't be across the board, but I think as, as people explore, and, and I think this is a moment in time where people are learning more about HVAC systems and all these yeah. different factors than they ever knew before. Right. Um, I think we all are. Uh, I do think that there will be, it will become a point of negotiation and a particularly of importance again for corporations um, that have, you know, bringing their employees into these buildings. And I think relationships that have gone on through COVID, you know, we see the, the, the landlords that can give them answers and ones that can't. And one, buildings that are where it's being addressed well and where it's not. So I think those comparison points will, will remain in their minds. So um, whether it's, you know, a focus on, on new, I think new development will have a leg up right now uh, in, in those conversations because they have the ability to introduce new systems and something completely sure. different. But when you look at Chicago as a, as, as a whole, you have really good owners and sponsors here. And even with like BOMA's partnership, there's a lot of factors that most of these buildings are already doing. So it's figuring out how to educate yourself and others how to talk about it in a way that's, that's meaningful. Um, but I think, you know, again, I think that Chicago's inventory as a whole has been, you know, has been very well um, sponsored over the years. Michael, what do you think? You've been quiet over there. Uh, no, I, I just I agree with Ellen. I mean, look at the end of the day, um, you know, there's been new buildings that are being built, but uh, I think probably we we would all agree that if we're truly in a recession, which we are, there's probably not a lot coming out of the ground over the next three to five years. Again, based on history, so I think a lot of it is what can you retrofit and and what sticks. I mean, every cycle there's an initial reaction, and I think that you know there's people that take very extreme positions on everything like you know we're going to add you know temperature scanning in all of our buildings regardless or we're going to do name what it is right and what will likely happen is we'll pull back to more of a mean and that means probably 12 to 18 months from now maybe a little longer than that so do i think there'll be changes absolutely um some of them yeah. will stick right like security in buildings just like security when you go to the airport that was the result of 2001 and for you know, my kids who really grew up post 2001, they don't know any different. That's just, they thought the way it's always been. For those of us who were around before, we know there were changes. This will be the same thing. There will be changes. Um, there will be some initial knee jerk reaction changes. But at the end of the day, I think everybody agrees, health and safety has really been on the forefront. That'll continue to be on the forefront. And we'll all look at what we can do to make our, our buildings, our assets feel better and feel safer. I think the other piece that you could have the, the, the greatest building when it comes to health and safety and HVAC systems, but if people are still getting to work by getting on the L or getting on a bus or getting on the Metro and they haven't changed their systems, is it really gonna, is it really gonna be an impact? So I think those pieces have to all fit together, very different than the suburbs. You drive in your own car, you say, okay, well, I'll keep my windows open or I'll, right? And it's just me. But it's very different when you have to deal with public transportation. So without that piece figured out from a health and safety perspective, the building piece standing alone isn't going to help everybody. Yeah, makes sense. Lisa, did you want to say something? Sorry, I can't cut you off. No, no, no. No, I, I think I agree with, with Ellen and, and Michael on this, on this topic about um, I guess what I would say, and this is maybe the tenant advisor that Steve and I are on, the, on that side of the table, is that I think um, just as security has become really sort of a, a ticket to entry in most cases post 9-11, I think that either wellness or just a, a much more robust janitorial and sort of cleaning and care of a building is going to become a ticket to entry. I don't know that it's something that if you advertise that you've got you know certain kind of wellness categories to your building that that's going to be for a premium it may mean that you get the deal versus that you don't but i think that across the board there are lots of things that that employees are going to expect to see very visibly every day and i don't think that that's going to go away right i think that those are the things no, just like security didn't go away i think that that's going to be something that people are going to consider you may be able to still have a three by five foot bench 
but that bench will be positioned in such a way that it's probably six feet away from someone on a long-term basis and that it will be very clean and you will see how clean your office is going forward. Yeah, the other little nuance is corporate real estate probably is now taking one step in the reentry uh, or even the philosophical changes going forward without talking to HR and legal, right? So uh, HR has to be confident that their, their workforce has got the most positive story in real story possible regarding the safety of getting back to work and the convenience. So um, however we understand it, evaluate it and spin it, it has to be a really good story that HR and legal are gonna buy into. And I think like Michael said, there will be something that will perpetuate going forward. And wellness was something that's not, it's not a new thing. It's just been heightened through the COVID obviously problem that, uh, that is now in the forefront. But wellness was a big deal you know, 24 months ago to build in this, in these new buildings and even retrofit. So it's not going away. That's for sure. I think yeah. it's, it's, well, a cost. Sense. it's, and the other last piece is, is there, what's the cost and how do, how are landlords communicating with tenants? If there's going to be a cost premium for upgrading systems, increased janitorial, increased security controls, all that kind of stuff. And is it a buck a foot or 50 cents a foot? All that I think should be really eyes wide open to all right. the tenants, you know, I think that's really critical. And it related that's to fine. that, we've, we've actually asked some of our clients, our managers, you know, can you quantify what that's gonna be? It's, it's too early right now in the process. I mean, they're right now trying to get their buildings ready for offices, the companies coming back and doing, you know, basic things like we're talking about increasing air filtration or janitorial, but they're still ordering products. They're still developing protocol and it may be a while, maybe a, you know, a few months at least until they really figure what that is and, and how that impact like operating expenses. So it's something we all have to, like you said, be open with. Sure, and then there'll be the premiums on top of that for the special services that specific companies have for their protocols. Right. And so I agree with you, Wendy. It's something I think we're, we're all hankering for, but it, it, it's just not quite, quite available yet. Right. right. Um, so I think this will be our last question before we take Q&A from, from the audience. But um, so, you know, when you look at cities like New York, as an example, you know, cities that are very dense, there's actually been, you know, these cities have been heavily, heavily impacted by this whole pandemic. And, you know, as an example, we, you know, we have a building out of Miami and there's been some interest rate right, for tenants that are looking for secondary offices and some of these other markets to get out of New York or to have the option to work out. Um, outside of these cities. So when you talk about Chicago, right, and the suburbs, um, you know, I know when this whole pandemic hit, you know, kind of the initial knee-jerk reaction for people is, hey, you know, I'm moving to the suburbs, you know, I got to get a house, I need a backyard, or, you know, I'm going to work in the burbs or whatever else. You know, I was probably one of those people. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, for me personally, if I'm going to the office on a daily basis, which I will at some point, be living in the suburbs just doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, so I'm just curious, you know, do you think that was more of just, you know, an initial reaction for people to say that you could maybe see a trend for companies to, you know, look at the suburbs again um, and maybe people moving out of the city? Or do you think that was just, you know, something that will, will go away and, again, just initial reaction to people getting scared? Michael? <laughs> You know, uh, again, we, we have properties uh, downtown and in the verb. So um, it's, it's a really good question. And, and what do I think? Do I, do I think that given that there has not been a trend, so, so let's go historically back. Again, those, there's a few of us who've, who've lived through these multiple times. There was the trend many, many years ago where all these companies, Sears and others, moved from downtown to the suburbs. And there was a Downtown was never coming back and it was going to be always in the burbs and that's where it was. No, oh, by the way, not everybody did move to the suburbs. No, oh, by the way, a lot, of, a lot of companies, a lot of law firms, a lot of accounting firms stayed in the city, right? Then the last 10 or 12 years, opposite trend. Everybody's moving downtown. Everybody's moving into the city, right? And did everybody? No, a lot. There were more that did than didn't. There were more multifamily that got built. Chicago became more of a 24-hour city than it did. So having said that, what do I think? Prognosticating. Um, I think there'll be more than there's been the last 10 or 12 years coming to the burbs because there hasn't been many, if any. Um, I do think there's a trend started about 18 months ago, trend being it's been delayed, but a lot of millennials started to move 18 months, 24 months ago to the suburbs. 
This has exacerbated it. We've seen it where we live up north. Um, if you talk to the residential brokers who handle sort of the North Shore, they'll tell you they've never seen as much, at least for the last three to four years, activity from people literally moving, not just testing the market from the city to the burbs. And I, I may have mentioned this when we pre-talked, I think I told Steve, we, we were planning on downsizing in the suburbs starting in January, and we were gonna put our house on the market in April. And we were, when the pandemic hit, we said, well, why would we do this? Nobody's gonna be buying. We got a call about two weeks in from our broker who said, you need to get on the market. You've never seen the activity level we have. And in about a four week period, we had 13 tours, 12 of which were from people in the city. Um, we ended up going under contract and we're moving, but the level of activity, and it was all, it was now having said that, because I think it's important, all of those people from what I understand were people who were anywhere from a 20% chance thinking of moving to the, to the burbs at some point to 50% or more. So they weren't people who were like, I'll never leave the city who said, I'm now absolutely leaving the city but they were people that this maybe between the pandemic and other things pushed them a little quicker and maybe a little faster. Yeah. So we've seen that. So I, what do I think? I think there'll be some, some moves to the suburbs. I think just like there were companies that went from the suburbs to the city, many of them started with a satellite office, right? Let's try it. Let's see how many people we have that live there. We think that could happen. Now, having said all of that, last, last thing, is that generally during a recession, people and companies don't move, right? So uh, I don't think over the next 12 to 18 months, we're gonna see any sort of exodus from anywhere. I think people are gonna deal with what they have and get through it. But do I think that 24 months to three or four or five years from now, could there be more activity in the suburbs than there were before? I think there, there, there will be. And I think if you look at even sublease space today, we've seen less in the suburbs so far in this cycle it may pick up than we have downtown. So that's my, my two cents. That's about Alan, a, you look like that's about a quarter. You want to say something? Like <laughs> 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 I have one anecdotal, couple anecdotal comments. Just, I, I think we were all thinking that too. And I think our you know, New York team got pretty excited about, we're gonna look at these surrounding markets, right? That's where people are gonna think about going and that kind of quieted down. Um, but we, we, I have gotten a couple calls this week for suburban brokers with suburban tenants saying they are looking downtown because they think didn't think they could afford it before and now they think that there might be this value to getting them there um and i don't know that the market's reset enough i'm like define value right we'll still try to figure it out but uh, i think it's too early to see what that is so that's that's my little bit of hope on uh keeping downtown <laughs> You know, I mean, I kind of think it's still labor-based, right? Look at United recently moved uh, a large ops out to the northwest suburbs, right? Uh, Walgreens moved a big group of IT people and tech digital downtown, but kept a huge workforce in, in Deerfield. The banks have predominantly a big presence in the suburbs, and all those are meeting talent uh, in labor pools that are easily accessed to these operation centers or even in the northern pharma world where a lot of those employees are, are more tethered to a suburban kind of work environment and or cultural collection. So I think, Michael, it, it will take a while to see if enough people move out of downtown who are in that tech digital side and maybe because they have families and they find suburban lifestyles cheaper and easier than living in downtown with schools and so forth. It may take that long to figure out it's, it's better to work in you know, one of the major you know, suburban hubs. Um, but I think it's going to be labor based. And I think that's still the that's still the equation that's going to be driving future as it has in the last decade. Right. Oh, so Patrick. panelists, thank you so much. Uh, this is very insightful. Um, if anyone on the phone would like to answer, ask a question, unmute your phones and go ahead and ask your question and then go back on mute. Uh, I will kick it off. Um, and probably more for Steve and Lisa uh, in, in our pre-call, we had some discussion about volume of activity, right? And Steve, I think you uh, broke it down into percentages. Could you share a little bit with the folks on the phone who are all waiting for deals, right? They're furniture people and they're architects and they're uh, GCs and, and they, they want to know when these deals are coming. So give us your yeah. kind of 
forecast on what's going to happen, what's happening now, what, what do you think is going to happen? I'm sure like CB, who's, you know, clearly, you know, top of the food chain and our nearest and dearest competitor, I think, along with Cushman. Our, our research, and we do this monthly with tenants in the market, I did a comparison a year ago. Uh, in the suburbs, and I'm reading from my notes, there was 93 active deals in 4 million feet a year ago in the suburbs, ranging 10,000 feet and above to current active deals, um, 30, so a, a reduced to a third, and about 2 million feet, so bigger deals overall. Uh, downtown, we had active tenants of about 80, and that's down to 40, and about the same percentage ratio of 5 million feet to 2.5 million feet. So just call it, on the average, activity has been paired back by 30, by 60 to 50 to 65 percent. Um, and I, I think that's realistic given everybody's um, lack of certainty or uncertainty about their business, you know, investments in capital, people are bending down the hatches with short-term renewals as opposed to making long-term commitments. I think the goal for all of us is that all changes a little bit, um, but everything that based upon office space is based upon headcount and demand for seats, I should say, it's seat count, not headcount. So until that gets figured out, I think we're going to be kind of in this low level bouncing environment um, for at least the next six months or 12 months until this whole pandemic thing is figured out. But I'd love to hear Lisa's take on it. Steve, I, I agree with you. I think your your estimates are are on par. I'd say if we both were to be to were, were to really dig into those numbers, we'd say that there probably is even more reduction that some of the things that we say are active were kind of fingers crossed that they're active or, or they're really in, in a bit of, a bit longer of a holding pattern than we typically would see. But um, I agree with you, unless a tenant absolutely has to make a decision, there's no reason to make a decision. Uh, the window of opportunity, which usually would say you have to make this decision before you lose certain leverage points, that's, that's yet to be determined as to what leverage points there will be. So, right. so if you don't have to make a decision, see how this all shakes out, figure out the balance between um, how much remote work you're going to have and, and how dense you're going to make your space, right? So if you're making a wholesale decision as a headquarters operation, you know, does that mean, you know, for every person that goes remote, you're going to increase your capacity and, or you're, you're, you're going to decrease your capacity so it's going to all even out? I don't think so. I think there will be some reduction in space. So yeah. some people so, might want to strike to your point when the iron's hot, thinking the market's going to collapse and find all of a sudden rents and con rents are down, concessions up and and if you don't do it now, you're not going to be able to make that deal. Sure. And I think that's as much the landlord panelists to talk about. Um, and is it is there a better time to strike? Should we hold off for four or five months until the thing softens even further? And, uh, you know, I think that's a good question to ask. And, you know, love your opinion on that without any color, BS color on that, Ellen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to let Joy handle that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a, I'm the moderator. I'm not Hello. supposed to give my opinion. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I go back to the point I know you talked about with subleases. It's like it's hard to define until you have some data and you can't go to your partners and say, yeah, let's just drop our rates 30 percent and see how it goes. Because I, I think you're, you're chasing something. It, and when you don't have a demand tied to it, right, or uh, an active tr transaction to to market to, it's hard to it's hard to know what you're going to do. Do we think that there's going to be softness and we're going to have to get more aggressive? Yes. Do we, I, but I think I think you know we're cautiously optimistic that you're going to have savings on the capital side, and we certainly are seeing that in some of our pricing. Great point. Great point. That that will help us offset. So, I think we talked about this before that uh, in Chicago as a, as a market um, doesn't have the highs and lows of our coastal you know uh, markets and. It's usually a net effective game and the band in Chicago, even when they think it's really great for the landlords, it's still pretty thin. So I think it's not <laughs> move that much. Um, and so I think you're only going to, hopefully the capital offsets that and everybody is doing fine, right? And why rents might need to move or concessions balance out so people feel like they're getting the deal they need to. Um, hopefully it's, you know, it's not going to be drastic. But again, Chicago just doesn't move in these huge swings like you see other places. Yeah, I think the other piece, the shoot of fall is going to be capital markets as refis, repositionings occur. Um, you know, where are lenders and equity partners thinking uh, about the underwriting of the future? And when coastal towns could impact, 
Chicago underwriting because of a REIT's perspective being, you know, shellacked in New York or San Francisco, and then their perspective in Chicago is much different. So even though rents are, excuse me, interest rates are very low, I think underwriting criteria and spreads are going to stay pretty high, uh, especially for value-add projects. So that, that's kind of a TBD out there, I think. Well, in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, cut this off. Uh, we want to keep these to the hour, and I know we're losing people to a 2 o'clock uh, meeting. So on behalf of Cornet, uh panelists and moderator, we thank you so much for your time today and sharing your insights with us and a lot of uh, great information we can all take away. Uh, for those of you looking for our next program, it will be next Thursday at 1 o'clock, and we'll be talking about the future of office design. So. Stay tuned and sign up uh, for, for next week's program. But um, everybody have a great day. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. It was fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye bye. Here's all. Bye bye.